So we are continuing through the book of Exodus in an effort to give an overview of the of the Bible, and we're we're still moving at a slowish pace, but that's okay. You guys have told me that that's okay, so that's that's what we're doing. All right. Now we where where we are is that Moses is back up on the mountain, and he's up on the mountain. And he's getting these instructions. So open your Bibles up to Exodus chapter 25. While you do that, I'm going to see if I can make this work. And we do have the projectors turned on, which is fantastic. And now I'm not ready on my end, but we can fix that. Maybe. Maybe not. Technology is so awesome when it works. And when it doesn't. Can be incredibly frustrating. So we'll see. We'll give that a minute. Where do you go when you want to be in the presence of God? So there's not not, not looking for a right or wrong answer, just looking for some answers. Where do you go? You go to prayer, not to a specific location, but to prayer. Good. Where do you go? Yeah. Okay, good. You go to a place in scripture and spend time there. Somebody else, where do you go when you want to be in the presence of God? Spend time in the Word. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Any quiet place. Any quiet place. Yeah. Going to this very, Jesus talking about going to that, to that closet, right? And if there's something to that, maybe. Go outside. Sure. I mean, really, we understand theologically that God is omnipresent. And so you don't have to go to any particular location, but some of us do find that being in a specific location is helpful, a quiet place, maybe a room in your house, going to a place in the scriptures that guide us to God. What we're looking at is the instructions for the place where the Israelite people were to go and to meet with God, where they would have their encounter with God. And and there's something very encouraging about this because the people are able to actually uh, have a, a sure connection with the Lord. They know exactly where to go to find Him, as it were. And then there's something that's hard about this because what we're going to realize is that it's actually not open to everybody. In fact, it's, it's pretty exclusive. And so it's like God is there and you're here and you need to keep your distance. And that's part of what we don't have to do in our situation. We are not in the situation of the Israelites. We do sometimes refer to this space as a sanctuary, and what we mean by that, or what we should mean by that, is that we've set this place apart for the purpose of worshiping God, but we don't mean that it's like the tabernacle and that God dwells exclusively in this building or something like that, right? So we, have a, we do have a different understanding when we talk about a sanctuary, it's not like it's not like the Old Testament. I think, maybe. Okay. Good start. Okay. So one of the things that you notice if you go through and you read through this, you'll notice that there are a lot of building materials that are listed. And one of the things I hope to, to point out to you today is that the tabernacle is supposed to be a reflection of the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden is the archetype, we've said, for the tabernacle and then the temple, because that's the place where God and his people dwell in perfect harmony and communion. And remember, what we've said is that the whole Bible is really about going from Eden to the new heavens and the new earth, and if you read about Eden and then you read about the new heavens and the new earth, there are a lot of similarities, and that's on purpose. The Bible is about God's restoration of everything that was lost because of sin. Now, of course, that's an oversimplification. There's a whole lot in between, but that is the trajectory, and this is another step in that direction. So. We're going to have a construction of this. There's the materials, lots of gold, silver, precious stones, spices, red and purple clothes, cloths, uh, and, and hides. 
they all speak of royalty. This should drive you back to Genesis chapter 2 and a lot of these precious stones and precious metals. Where did we see them? Also in Eden. Everything's built out of what your translation calls acacia wood. We don't actually know what that is. Um, we know what acacia wood is, but we don't actually know for certain what that Hebrew word means. It's interesting because when the ancients would translate it into other languages, the way they would translate it is the incorruptible tree. And so you've got this, again, sort of hint back towards the Garden of Eden, a garden place, lots of trees, uh, maybe even the tree of life. At least that's what, what the rabbis would think when they would read this. Now, the first major piece of furniture that we read about is the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant it symbolizes God's footstool. Sometimes God is pictured as up in heaven, and this would be sort of where his feet make contact with, uh, with the Lamb, and you can read about that in the uh, passages quoted there. The pieces are to be overlaid with or made with pure gold. It will contain the testimony that the Lord is going to give to Moses. The Ten Commandments are going to be in there, along with some other items that get added along the way. And it's the only item, the only piece of furniture in the most holy place or the holy of holies. And so this is an exclusive place. Now, again, how does this connect to the, by the way, this is an artist's rendition of, of that. Um, we don't actually know what it looked like. No, Indiana Jones did not find it. Um, <laughs> or at least we don't think he did. Right? So, the best we know that's just fiction. But the Holy of Holies is an important place. It's the, it's the place where God's presence is directly. And the only time anybody's allowed to go in there, except for presumably when they're moving, because they do move this, this is a mobile structure, is on the Day of Atonement. It's the high priest who goes in. And so while we're reading about this joyous reality that God will be with his people, he's also separate from his people, but if you go to the end of the Bible, the new Jerusalem comes down from heaven, and it's a giant cube, right? And if you read the dimensions of the tabernacle, it's actually uh, really, more specifically the temple, where this is definitely the case, it's a cube. And that's the whole idea. The place where only the ark could be, where only the presence of God could be, except for that one day here when the high priest went in, is now where God and his people are going to dwell together forever. Now, the ark itself in the New Testament is not spoken of except maybe in one place. Go to Romans 3.25 and, and do put a marker back there in Exodus 25 so you can at least follow along with me. It's not translated in a way that would make this obvious to you, but we read about this in Romans 3.25. This word is translated propitiation, I believe, by the New American Standard Bible. It says this. <clears throat> do, 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 3, 3.25. I was looking at 3.29, which didn't make sense. And, well, you got to look at the right verse. Okay. God, whom God displayed, is talking about Jesus, Jesus Christ, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God he passed over the sins previously committed. We'll pause there. It's in the middle of a larger argument. But here's this word, propitiation. First of all, does anybody have a different translation? Yeah, what do you have? Okay, sacrifice, atonement, good. There was a big debate back in the late 70s and 80s among scholars about whether this should be translated as propitiation or expiation. And those are both words that we hardly ever use in normal conversation. Right? Those are good Christianese words that nobody really knows what they, what they mean a lot of times. Anybody have a definition for propitiation? 
satisfaction. So you propitiate a, a person when there is wrath that is going to be poured out. You propitiate a person and you, uh, you stop that wrath from coming by making some sort of offering, some sort of sacrifice to satisfy the wrath of, of a being. Expiation is a word that would mean something like to erase or to wipe away. And so our sin is, is wiped away, but it's, it's, it's wiped away because of propitiation. Something satisfies the wrath of God. All that to say, it's a, it's a Greek word, and it doesn't really um, actually mean exactly either one of those things. It's illustrarian. And it refers to the mercy seat on the top of the ark. And the reason we translated propitiation is because that's where propitiation was made. So blood was put there, and it was the place where basically the wrath of God was satisfied in the Day of Atonement. And what's being said here is that Jesus is the propitiation. He's the place where the wrath of God is satisfied and the sins of man are, are dealt with. And so we don't have an ark, and we don't need an ark, because we have Jesus Christ. And the mercy seat is not something that we need because we have a propitiation. Okay? So anyways, there you have it, a uh, reference to, uh, I might, did I just say that's the only reference? It's not the only reference, um, but it's the one that we'll look at for tonight. You don't read a lot about the Ark of the Covenant, but I think that's a really interesting place where it pops up and you may not have noticed it. So, what other kind of furniture do we have in there? We've got a table. The table holds the bread of the presence. Uh, and so there's this bread, there's 12 loaves, they go on top of the table, they go in front of the lampstand, and we're told that the light is supposed to shine on the table. They're replaced every week and they become food for the priests, but they represent the tribes of Israel in the presence of God. And so even though they weren't allowed in there, there are these loaves, and they also represent God's provision for the people. We'll notice that some of Jesus' I am statements line up with uh, some of these things. And so Jesus does talk about being the bread of life, and I think manna is the primary focus that he has when he says that. But again, here is the bread, reminding us that God provides for his people and that his people are, uh, are symbolically in his presence. There's the lampstand. By the way, you all know this, right? These are just somebody's uh, renditions. What is interesting for the lampstand and I think the table um, is that the triumphal, one of the triumphal arts, uh, you can see some pictures of the temple furniture that was carried off by um, Vespasian, I believe it was Vespasian. Uh, and so, anyways, the, the, this is one of the few that we get that we actually have an old carving of, and I could have put that up there, I didn't think to. It's intentionally supposed to look like a tree. Absolutely, it's supposed to look like a tree. When you read about it, um, you see that it's supposed to have these almond buds and flowers uh, on it, and you can read about that at the end of chapter 25, because this is about recreating that place where God and his people met, all right? Um, you can't really, you, that's not helpful, so we just keep going. Uh, sorry, this, the image is too small for us to, to do anything with that. The, the curtains, and we start reading about the curtains in chapter 26, they are um, <clears throat> embroidered on the inner curtain to remind Israel of the holiness of God. You've got the cherubims there that are embroidered. You can read verse 1 there. Moreover, you shall make the tabernacle with ten curtains of fine twisted linen, blue and purple and scarlet material, all very royal colors. You shall make them with cherubim, the work of a skillful workman. So there's going to be the inner structure made with goat hair, and you've got frames, and they're all overlaid with gold, and the crossbars that are overlaid with gold. There's an inner curtain and an entrance. We'll talk about that inner curtain for a second. It's also, in verse 31 of chapter 26, 
it is also embroidered with a cherubim. And so again, I'm going to remind you, this is Eden. This is the holy place that God guarded with a cherubim. And you go back to Genesis, and after God sends Adam and Eve out of the garden, it's protected with the cherubim. Now, in the New Testament, this curtain is torn. Remember the death of Jesus? The, the curtain is torn from top to bottom. I want you to see uh, that, uh, that story I can tell you, I just did. But I want you to go down and read with me in the book of Hebrews. It's because of this reality that we're, that we're discussing, Jesus opening the way to God in his flesh being the curtain, we'll see. That you and I can say, well, yeah, I meet God when I go outside. I go to be with God, a quiet place. And I find God in the scriptures. And we, can, we can experience and enter into the presence of God with confidence from any location. That's because of Jesus, right? So in the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, starting in verse 19, would somebody read verses 19 to 22, Hebrews 10, verses 19 to 22? That's great. Thank you. And Mark read a little bit further for us, but I actually am thankful for that because it's going to help uh, with the next question I have for you. All right. So the author of Hebrews is going to use this imagery of the tabernacle. And he says, we have confidence, something that hardly anybody in Israel had. In fact, we don't know if this is true, but it makes a really good story and you can see how it would be true. The medieval rabbis told us that they would tie a rope around the ankle of the high priest when he would go into the Holy of Holies. And one of the things his garment does have is these little noisemakers, bells of some sort. And they would tie a rope around them so that if he died in there, that they could pull him out without having to go in. Now, uh, we, again, we don't know, the Bible doesn't say that they did that, the Bible doesn't say to do that, but at least in some rabbi's mind that made sense that, okay, if this is how you would handle this sort of situation, you prepare, you, you get a good rope, all right? I don't know. But it speaks to the reality of how serious it was to enter into the presence of God. It was a really, really, really big deal. And here the author of Hebrews is saying, we have confidence to go into the holy place. Hopefully not arrogance and pride, but we have confidence to enter into the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way. So there's a new way, yeah. So the only way they could go in was that on the Mount of the That's right. So on the Day of Atonement, that's the only day. Once the temple is built and they're not moving stuff around, that's the only time you would ever go in. That's, and, and we have this confidence to enter in there's a new and living way. It's the, it's the way of Jesus. It's the way of Jesus' blood. And he inaugurated that for us through the veil, through that curtain that's guarded by the cherubim. You now can go with confidence. But the author of Hebrews says that that curtain is his flesh. What does he mean by that? We can go through the veil, which is his flesh. Well, there's a sense in which uh, it's, it's through Jesus that we enter into this space. 
And there's another sense in which it's on account of Jesus that we enter into that space. And both of those things are, are right. Through Jesus, on account of Jesus, we are able to go into this holy place because we have the great high priest over the house of God. We draw near to God with sincere heart and full assurance, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. We've been purified. We can go. We're going to read about the consecration of the priest. We've been consecrated, and we are now welcomed to confidently go into the presence of God. Now, what's interesting is, what does the author of Hebrews immediately shift to after he said you'd have access to the holy place? What does he then encourage the, the recipients to do? Okay, to meet together, have sincere heart. To encourage each other. He comes into all of this each other stuff. Right? So in my mind, when I think of where do I go to, to be in the presence of God, I oftentimes do think of a quiet place, which is one of the things that was said. And that's right. And Matthew tells us that. We go to the quiet place, we speak to God from that place. It's not wrong. But where the author of Hebrews goes is don't. And somebody else said you can go into nature. I also feel that way. I love to go for a walk. I love the mountains. Um, I love you know being out for a hike or the ocean and just it's meditating on who God is. But that's also not where the author of Hebrews goes. Not because it's wrong, but because he has a different point to make. His point is that, hey, you have access to the holy place, so you guys should all get together. And you should encourage one another. One, where you encounter God, for him, the point he's making is when we come together as a body. And, and that's what church is about. It's not about a, a building sanctuary, but it's about coming together with God's people because God is present with his people as we gather. Right? That's, yeah. And we minister to God by ministering to each other in part, right? And that's what Matthew 25 is about. What you did for the least of these, you did for me. At least of these, my brothers. It seems that actually Christians are the primary group in view in Matthew 25. We'll get there someday. And the uh, and so we, we serve the Lord by serving each other. The spiritual gifts that we have. Holy Spirit ministers to us as we're ministered to by our, our brothers and sisters because he's gifted each one of you and me to serve and so it's not we certainly never worship one another we know our worship goes to God but we do experience God through the body of Christ gathered and that seems to be uh, the, the practical application that the author of Hebrews is making right after he says you can go into presence of God, and then he says, y'all should get together, right? And so uh, it's not at all to minimize your quiet time alone with the Lord. It's not at all to minimize uh, meeting the Lord when you're out in nature or in your devotional time as you read scripture. All those things that we said are, are good and right, but don't forget coming together. That's one of the main ways that we, that we meet God. It's so important. Now I say that and all of you are here, so obviously you get that. Uh, but we want to encourage one another and encouraging one another means encouraging our brothers and sisters who maybe aren't around uh, when, they, when they need to be around so that they too can be a part of this. So, okay, so there's our, our inner curtain. There is a, uh, an altar for the burnt offering. Uh, by the way, this points forward, again, Hebrews, no real surprise there, uh, lots of this imagery does come up in Hebrews, and in Hebrews 13.10, if you're still there, you can look at it, or you can just hear, hear me, this points forward to something greater, for they, uh, oh, well, I'm having a hard time tonight, that's chapter 12, Jesse, but I'm going to do 13 first, I'm a little tip. okay, here we go, uh, we have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. And so all of these things in the tabernacle, they're pointing forward to something greater. 
Uh, the author of Hebrews knows that this was built on a pattern. I think we looked at that last week. And we have access to the heavenly realities that the tabernacle was, a, was an earthly prefiguring of. So anyways, here's the, the burnt offer, uh, the altar of burnt offerings. That would be, if you can see that at all, that would be the big square uh, that is to the right. Okay, the first thing you would encounter when you walk into the courtyards. All right, so we're back in Exodus. We're learning uh, more about these uh, pieces of furniture. Then we get some instruction on the oil that is supposed to be prepared. And so we've got to have oil for the lamps. And there's just a, uh, it's just olive oil. Everybody needed to bring some olive oil and they would smush the olives and get the oil. Okay. So how is the tabernacle encouraging and discouraging? I've sort of, sort of already answered that, but somebody else, give, me, give it to me in your own words. How's the tabernacle encouraging and discouraging if you're an Israelite? What's encouraging about it? There's a place to go. Is anybody ever encouraged by clear instructions? Any, any of you clear instruction kind of people? You like that? Okay, some of you are, and some of us we you know we don't we don't read the directions. We just go for it. Um, that's that's kind of the category that I'm in. Sometimes having clear instructions though is incredibly encouraging because you know exactly what you need to do, right? Okay, this is how we interact with God. God has revealed himself to us, and we don't have to guess. And while we don't do the tabernacle anymore, God has revealed himself to us, and we don't have to guess. That's really, really good news. So that was incredibly encouraging to an Israelite to know, okay, this is where God is. This is how I approach him. This is what he expects of me. That's really helpful. Okay, how would this be discouraging? Or, or answer either one. Yeah. So, so yeah, today, reading about this can be, so there's a reason why if you go to Jerusalem, you can go to the Wailing Wall, even today. Jews are mourning the loss of, of this place. They have obviously adapted because it's been uh, almost 2,000 years that they haven't had this place. But, but yes, they're, they are longing for this kind of a place to go to. Constant sacrificing, constant requirement of blood, constant requirement that you have a debt that needs to be paid. And that's intimidating. Yeah. You were always separated from the presence. Yeah, and so there's this discouraging fact that God's right there, but I can't I can't go unless you're the high priest. And even if you're the high priest, it's pretty terrifying to go, right? And so there's this awe of God that is still very overwhelming. At what point? So I think that um, I think they had an understanding that he was omnipresent to, to a degree. I don't I don't know exactly at what point in their history, but I think you can get that from the Old Testament. But there was a special presence of God, his sort of immediate personal presence that to be found in the tabernacle, I think is what I'm trying I think that's that would be a good way to describe it. Yeah. So, you know, when we get to the temple, they end up building a court for Gentiles. It's like, you can come this far, but you can only come this far. One of the things we'll read about in, in the laws is that depending on your uh, physical well-being and other things that determine your cleanliness, you may or may not be allowed to go into the courtyard and offer a sacrifice or draw near in any sort of way. So there were lots of people who were excluded. And so there, there is a, 
And God is teaching us something about his holiness through this stage in, in history so that you and I today, at least in part, so that you and I today can be overwhelmed with joy by the great privilege that we have because it was not open to everybody. Uh, many people, right? Uh, so the, when you get into the, when you get into it, the laws, uh, many women would spend much of their life unclean and not able to go near the presence of God. It's just the way it was. And so there are so many men who were uh, in any way had any sort of physical deformity or any kind of skin disease or all kinds of things that would disqualify women and then women from being able to go into the presence of God. So we've got really a mixed message. And it's interesting, again, because we, we can always wonder what, what, what would have happened uh, if this is what the Israelites asked for, though, right? Remember, because God was saying there's going to be this shofar sound and you're all going to come into the mountain. And they didn't like that. And they were like, Moses... Nope. <laughs> we don't want to go into the mountain. We don't want to go into the presence of God. You seem to be able to go in and come back. Why don't you just do that for us? And so in some ways, this is God giving them what they asked for. Okay, you want a very mediated presence? Uh, then this is, this is what you get. And we, of course, have no idea what it would have been or what it wouldn't have been. The next thing we get is the garments of the priest. And one of the things that... Uh, is stunning to me is the headband, for lack of a different term, the, the gold plate that was attached to the turban of the priest, and it says, Holy to the Lord. The priest is a glorious figure when he's dressed in this clothing, and that's the whole point. It is given in chapter 28, we're told in verse 2. You shall make the holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for beauty. He was supposed to just look absolutely uh, glorious. This was a way to show that he was holy. He was set apart for the service of God. So, of course, uniquely true of Jesus, the high priest, because this high priest in the Old Testament, he is only holy in an exterior sense, whereas Jesus is holy in a complete and full sense. One of the amazing things is that we read in the book of Revelation, and a lot of times we only look at the context of Revelation, and it is to contrast with the mark of the beast in Revelation, but we read that God's people are sealed, and his, his name is written on their foreheads. And if you were a Jewish person and you heard that, you would go, I know somebody else who had the name of God written on their forehead. It was, it was the priest who had that great privilege. Now, what I think is interesting, and we can leave it at just interesting, is that this was an intentionally bright and shining and royal-looking outfit. These are all very royal colors. And so we have a, we have a royal-looking priest here who's wearing a crown, saying that he's holy to the Lord. It's written on his head. And the, the Jews, when they would reflect on this in their non-biblical literature, would talk about how he was shining. It was, he was, he was, he was lit up and glorious. And so uh, here's a, a, a letter that accompanied that Greek translation of the... <clears throat> Of the, Old Test, uh, of the Old Testament that we call a Septuagint. And this is somebody's uh, experience of seeing the high priest. They said, we were struck with great astonishment when we beheld Eleazar at his ministration and his apparel and the visible glory conferred by his being garbed with the coat that he wears and the stones that adorn his person. There's these 12 stones that are on his chest, on his ephod, yeah. And they're representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Their names are inscribed there. Uh, so there's all of this, uh, all of this shining. Here's, uh, oh, I skipped over. Here's another, uh, this is written around 200 BC, talking about the high priest. And they say, how, he, how, how was he honored in the midst of the people? 
in his coming out of the sanctuary. He was as the morning star in the midst of the cloud and the moon at full, the sun shining in the temple of the Most High, and the rainbow giving light in the bright clouds, and the flower and roses of the spring year, and the lilies of the rivers of the waters, and the branches of frankincense tree in the time of summer. This is how they're imagining the priest in the temple. It sounds like a garden, right? That's, that's the whole point. In the time of summer, as fire and incense and a censer, as a vessel of beaten gold, all with all manner of precious stones, as a fair olive tree budding forth fruit, as a, as a cypress tree which groweth up in the clouds, when he put on the robe of honor and was clothed with the perfection of glory, when he went up to the holy altar, he made a garment of holiness honorable. And so there's this image of just this, this brightness and this life that's associated in the, in the Jewish mind with the high priest and his clothing. And it's very much tied back to the, um, what we think of when we read about Eden. A lot of the materials that we read about, we only read about them in two other places, in Genesis 2 and Revelation 21. And again, those are, the, those are the garden, that's the garden and the garden city of God at the end. I'm not going to read that quote to you, that's, we're, we're going to run out of time. Um, there's an established Jewish tradition that understood Adam and Eve to have a characteristic of luminescence. Interesting, again, it's just, it's a Jewish tradition. Unfortunately, where you're most likely to hear this today is in Mormonism, um, and it's, they, they picked up on this. I think they've made some things out of it that I wouldn't go with. But one rabbi says that the apple of Adam's heel shone uh, the globe of the sun, how much more the brightness of his face. So Adam was just glowing in glory. We do see that people spend their time in the presence of God. They glow. Right? Moses goes and he spends time in the presence of God. He's glowing with glory. Others understood that they were given this, uh, this garment of glory to show that God wasn't going to forget them. Why bring this up? Because it's another way to connect what the tabernacle was supposed to be pointing to. It's a, res it's a restoration of Eden. It's a restoration of God's fellowship with his people. And his people, when they spend time in his presence, they shine like him. They look like him. God is said to be clothed in light, right? In Psalm 104, we read about that. And so then, that helps us to understand and appreciate the New Testament image. The New Testament tells us in multiple places that we're sons of light, sons of the day, sons of life, right? While you have the light, believe in the light, so you became sons of light, John 12, 36. You were formerly darkness, but now you're light in the Lord, and children of light. So there's all of this light imagery, and it comes through in Exodus, and it all goes back to Genesis, and it's about being in communion with the true God. I want to just skip through a couple things. We've got two minutes left. The consecration of the priesthood is laid out. There's the clothing. They put the clothing on. There's sacrifices. There's a sacred meal. They eat the flesh of the sin and guilt offerings. Also sounds like something that maybe we hear in the New Testament. Uh, repeated for seven days, and then there's the perpetual offerings that are started. We're told about the altar of incense. And how's all this going to get done? How are you going to pay for it? Well, there's going to be a mandatory offering, and everybody's going to pay, and the word is actually ransom. And it's a reminder that everything belongs to God. So God's people are constantly being told, hey, all of this belongs to him. It's all him. It's all his. You belong to him, and you have to ransom your life back from him. You have to pay to get your life back. And that's why we understand in the New Testament how the greatest price has already been paid. Now we continue to give as New Testament believers and that, uh, that paradigm is still helpful to understand oh, everything belongs to God. All of who I am belongs to God. We don't just go, okay, I'm going to give God a little bit of my stuff. No, it's all His, right? And the Israelites understood that. They had to pay a ransom for their own lives. Okay. 
Um, let's close with this. This is all going to be done by some very skilled workers. In chapter 31, we read about the craftsmen who are going to do this. And what's amazing, we read in verse 1, Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bezal, uh, Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I, I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and understanding in knowledge and all kinds of craftsmanship to make artistic designs for work in gold and silver and bronze and the cutting of stones for setting and for carving wood that he may work all kinds of craftsmanship. So this man, or these men, that we're going to read, keep reading, there's more than one, they're enabled by the Spirit of God to do His work. They're supposed to be reflecting God. How does God create? Through the Spirit, right? You go back to the creation, He speaks through His Word, and it's the Spirit of God hovering over the waters. God's servants are oftentimes said to be empowered by the Spirit. Ezekiel foresees a time when everyone will be empowered by the Holy Spirit. And how does God get His work done today? Through the Holy Spirit, right? I mean, God, God can do all kinds of stuff. He's God. He can do all sorts of different ways. But what's amazing is God has this big mission that he told us about. Get the gospel out there, right? Big deal. Somebody was asking me the other day, why doesn't he just do it? Right? Like, why doesn't he just go like, boom, done. Gospel's out there. Everybody knows. Well, the short answer is, I don't know exactly why God does what he does, because he's God and I'm not. But God consistently throughout the Bible chooses to work through people. And the normal way that God reaches people with the gospel, the ordinary way that God reaches people with the gospel, is through the preaching and teaching of his word. Paul says in chapter, Romans chapter 10, somebody's got to go. Somebody's got to tell them. And those people... Where do they get the ability to do that? The Holy Spirit. And so we read, oh, God's going to work through his, his church. And his church, and they're going to they're going to send people out, and they're going to do all these things. This is the, the, the church of Jesus Christ, that the gates of hell are not going to prevail against. And how's the church going to get anything done? God's going to give people. And God's going to give them to do all kinds of things. And one of the things I love about this, we, we tend to always go, oh, when the Spirit gifts somebody, they become a pastor. Um, sometimes they do. But sometimes they become a metal worker, right? That's what happened here. Or a stone worker. Or all, all kinds of things that God does with the people. But he gifts them to do his work. And so there's so many things that are different it, from the Old Testament to our time today. We spend a lot of time thinking about those differences. And then there's some things that are absolutely the same. God works through spirit-empowered servants to get the job done. And that's how the tabernacle was built. And that's how the gospel goes forth. God works through spirit-empowered servants, which is what we're supposed to be. So there you go. Now you know a little bit about some of the furnishings of the temple. And hopefully we can see how at least some of these things point us forward to Jesus and these connections between creation and new creation, which are the two bookends of the Bible, everything in the middle, and Jesus who is the climax. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. There's so much here. We thank you that we live in this time, in this place, where we can approach you with confidence, where we can enjoy presence and we can come before your heavenly throne. Father, you are so gracious to us. We thank you for Jesus Christ, our, our high priest. He is truly glorious, not just because of clothing that he wears, but because of who he is. We thank you and praise you for him not only being our priest, but being the sacrifice in our place. He paid the price for us so that your wrath was poured out on him and not on us. Lord, may we 
also 